I'm going to show you things that's going to help you catch more fish. I'm going to show you how to set up, how to set up your box, your rollers, do your elastic, make a rig, plumb the depth, play fish, net fish. I'm Tommy Pickering and this is my pole fishing masterclass. He's going to have a bad back. Bad back. Bad back. Definitely bad back. Now, one of the things that I go, I can walk around and watch a match, I can watch fishermen, and I can tell whether they're going to have an aching back or a bad back at the end of the match. Now, I've got a system which I'm going to show you. Why have I worked on this system? It's because I used to have a bad back. It used to hurt me, so I worked on a system that helped me. And if that helps you from getting an aching back at the end of the match, it's done its job. If you're uncomfortable, you're not concentrating on what it's all about, catching fish. The first thing to do when you're fishing is you don't want your knees above your hips. If you have your knees above your hips, your back will, will tilt like that and you'll have a bad back. And what you do, you stand like that on your box, you bend your knees, and wherever the nick of your knee is, where it bends there, that front of the box wants to be about an inch below. And in this case it is. And then that way, your legs fold round the front of the box and then you can sit comfortably. The next thing is this, I want the back of the box there half an inch higher than the front of the box. Now that's really important that because what it does it just slightly tilts and what I use as a spirit level is that. A bait tub that's three quarter full of water and I want that to be lower at the front than it does the back. If it's like that and it's tilted, that means all your weight's transferred onto your back and you'll finish up with a bad back. Most people do that. They actually tilt backwards. So that back wants to be half an inch higher than the front. So it's not too much. You don't want it tilting like that much. You'll, you'll slide and fall into the water. Just enough to transfer all the weight off your back onto your feet, which keeps your feet flat on your, flat, on your platform. So basically, when I sit down on that, I can feel the weight going forward, which put my knees are above, uh, below my hips, which transfers all the weight off there onto my feet, which keep my feet flat. That way, you won't have an aching back at the end of the match. And if that helps you from getting an aching back at the end of the match, it's done its job. Plumbing the depth. Why do we plumb the depth and what is it? Well simply when you're fishing most fish feed on the bottom so you need to know where the bottom is in your peg and the depth that you're going to be fishing at. So what is a plummet? Well basically it's one of these, it's a, it's a big lump of weight and that's called cyclops because it's got one eye and you put your hook through the, the eye and you thread it into the cork on the bottom. Now what I like about that is it's, it's a bigger weight, it's a flatter bait, it's not going to roll down any slopes or anything like that. But the idea of that, it's a big weight and you can suspend it to the float so you can get the bottom which is what you really want and want to be fishing. So when you put that in obviously your float is going to sink. So the way to get the correct depth is this, you adjust it at the depth you think and if it sinks you add more and if it sits up you take some off. So if you can see the float out of the water, you take it off, and if it goes under the water, you add to it until you get in a position that you've got it right. And the correct position is this. When you are fishing and you, you plumb around in the area that you're going to be fishing and it's flat, you realise that it's perfectly flat, I plumb it so that it goes to the bottom of the bristle. So when it's in the water and you, you, you direct to the plummet, all you can see is the bristle. If it's a little bit higher, just lower it. And I think that's about perfect for fishing on flat bottoms. However, if your peg is on a slope, it's, different, it's more difficult then because you're, because you're fishing on a slope, the depth is different there than it is an inch away. So you've got to do, do it a little bit different. And what I do, I have a little bit of security. So when it's on a slope, instead of plumbing to the bottom of the bristle, plumb to the bottom of the body. And that way you've got an inch, inch and a half of security. So if your float just moves away an inch from the area that you're going to be fishing, you know that you're still going to be on the bottom. How do I get to that position? So when you go into your peg, and like I said, all you do, put it at a depth that you'll think, and the position that you'll want to fish, if you'll just plumb, 
pull them around until you get the position I want. Keep lowering it. Now I know that's on a slope because you can see now as I'm going out it's sinking under the water. So I'm on a slope. So when you're on a slope look for the spot that you want and when you get the, the spot that you want make sure that the plummet is on the thing and you can see that all the body and the bristle is stuck out. Now that is perfect for me. I'm happy with that, I'm happy with that position. I know that I've got a little bit of security that the bait is on the bottom. The bait will find its level and, and it'll go to the floor. It won't, be out of the, it won't be away from the bottom. That is the correct position. And then when you release it like that, it just sits there and all you can see is the bristle. If it starts to go under the water, it means that it's sloping away. So just be a little bit careful. Them's the only two ways that I do when I'm plumbing. If it's flat to the bottom of the bristle and if it's on a slope to the bottom of the body. And if you keep it like that, you won't go far wrong when you're plumbing depth. When I'm making a rig, I like to keep it just nice and simple like most of my fishing. So when I come on a venue like this and I'm fishing for F1s and carp and it's a bit of a mixture and I'm expecting getting bites pretty quick. The float is pretty straightforward. I like the slim body style. There's lot, you'll go in a shop and you'll see lots of different floats. And that one is just a slim body. Now, I go on the size of the float with the depth that I'm going to be fishing. For example, on that float, when I plumb it, I plumb to half a, half a bristle. When I shot it, just to half a bristle. You don't want any more than that. I have three rubbers, as you can see, one just under the body, one in the middle and one at the bottom that's just slightly overlapping. And that's all to keep it nice and tight so it don't move. But this is where the key thing is, the hook and the terminal tattle. The hook depends on whether you're fishing maggots, fulker baits or banded baits, whether it be a, a band or whether it be straight. In this case, it's just a straight hook. Now then, this, the terminal tattle, all depends on the depth. So when I'm fishing up to three foot of depth, the distances are quite crucial because the hook length up to three foot of depth is four inches, 10 centimetres, that's all that it is. And then I always go loop to loop with my hook length to my main line. The reason for that is more practical. I'm not saying it's the best knot, it's just more practical because if you have a problem, you can change it dead easy. Above the two loops, I put a number 10 stot. And I just put that just above the two loops. So I've got a four inch hook length and then the first dropper. I have two droppers. And the second one is four inches above that. And then the rest of the shot that cocks the float to half a bristle is four inches above. So I've got a four inch hook length, a dropper, four inches, a dropper, four inches, bulk, four, four, four. So that's all you've got to remember. When you're fishing up to three foot of water, if you remember four, 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 you won't go far wrong. But if I'm fishing deeper and I want to go further depth maybe just here where I'm going to be fishing in the channel where it's up to six foot deep it's a little bit different and to be fair most places you go in and it is deeper it's exactly the same except the distance is a six inch hook length at number 10 stot six inches to your next stot and number 10 then your bulk is six inches above that so up to three foot it's four 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 above three foot it's six 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 that keeps it nice and simple. And to help you out with all that, all you've got to do is carry a ruler about with you to measure it. And eventually you'll get used to them distances, but I carry a ruler about to do all them measurements. I always carry it about in my box. And that's as simple as it gets. So up to three foot, four, 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 over three foot, six, 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 and you won't go far wrong. And that's your terminal tattle and your float. And so, just keep it nice and simple and trust me if you went in my box nearly every one of my rigs is made to that and if you'll stick to them two measurements trust me you won't go far wrong with your terminal tackle. Well, I, I don't normally throw bait in on a pole. What I like to do, I like to feed it through a pot. In the summer, you might want to put a bigger pot on. In the winter, just a small pot. Now, I'm quite cute. What I try to do is, I try to kid the anglers near me sometimes 
by not filling that pot up. Because if you fill that pot up, there's a lot of bait. And sometimes if you feed too much, you get too many fish in your peg. And you can see that there's a tremendous amount of bait there. So as you can see, my pole pot is, is, a, is a small one. Most people feed with one of them. It's really dangerous is one of them. Because what happens is, if you fill that up and put that amount of bait in, what happens is you draw too many fish in your peg. Now, is that a problem? Most times it is, because what happens is you get line bites, you get indications, you foul up fish. The idea is to make them competitive. And if they've got that amount of bait in their peg, they don't want to pick your up bait up, and you feel up, you get tails and everything in your peg, and you finish up foul looking them. I know it's happened to you, because it's happened to me. The bait I'm using today, I'm going to use a two-in-one baits. And I'm going to use the normal size ones. Um, I'm going to hook these, there's four different colours. But if it gets colder, the mini ones will be far superior. The fish don't want as much bait, to be honest with you. So the mini ones, in conjunction with one of the normal size ones, will be a perfect presentation, perfect bait that the fish are going to feed. You've really just got to work it out yourself which, which is the best. In colder climates, colder months, I'll probably just feed the mini, the micro ones, and in the summer I'll probably just feed the normal size ones. So sometimes you might want to put five or six or seven or eight into a pot. Don't be afraid, just because of the size of the pot doesn't mean to say you've got to fill it up. But the most important thing is, when you've got a pot on, you're feeding where your float is. So you're feeding and fishing in your float. It's so precise, you're around that area, all the time. That's the idea of the pole pot. Because I'm feeding two in one hook baits, really I want to be putting one on the hook because that's the idea. You can get them out of the bag, you throw them in as feed, you pick one up, pick a colour that you want, the yellow, the white, the black or the red, and you just hook it like that. You just put it in the centre, turn it on the hook, and as you can see there, it's hooked perfectly. That's two in one bait. But you can use corn, you can use maggots, you can use any other kind of bait on that same hooking principle but the idea of two in one is to feed and fish with the same bait and that's all that you do so take your time put your bait in feed and it all comes in a straight line in a tunnel bait going down through that and your hook bait should be in the middle of that when you present it in the swim always on a pole fish with a pole pot the best way of fishing is little and often and a pole pot allows you to do that One of the great uh, advantages of fishing the pole is that you're in control of, of everything around where you want to fish. What I mean by that is, as you can see, I've just put some bait in my pot, not a lot, and what I'm going to do now is put my pole together and as I ship out, the first thing I'm going to do is feed that area. What I'm looking for is to get to the same spot all the time is use my elbow. So I'm going to put elbow end of the pole, so you ship it till you can fill your elbow. Line it up with something, like I'm lining it up to a platform. And the first, my first thought is to feed. So I tip it over two inches off the water, just tip it straight in, so all the bait goes in one swoop. If you're using sticky pellets, then just turn it over, tap your pole like that, and it'll come out. Then what I always do, I lift the, the float out of the water, just so it's touching bottom of the water and I leave that for 10 seconds. It's called 10 second rule, so that the, the rig goes in, in a straight line and it's on the uh, tunnel of bait that you've actually put in, it's falling through, and your rig now is straight. After 10 seconds, it'll be straight and you can lower it to the feeding fish and into the bait that you just put in. But you're in ton total control of that little area that you're fishing there. You're not just fishing anywhere, you're in control of that bait. And all I'm trying to do is get a tunnel of bait going down in the same spot and the fish to come in, the competitive, and what they do, hopefully your hook bait is in the middle of them and they pick your hook bait up. And that's all that you're trying to do. It's an easy way of catching fish. You're fishing right at the end of the pole, you're in total control because you've got the pole over the bait. 
It's a simple way of catching fish. And that's all you've got to do. Keep going to your marker up far bank. That's the number one thing. Second, go to your elbow, put it into your hip, the pole, and that way you'll always go to the same spot. Feed, 10 second roll, and you know that your hook bait then is in the bait. And that's all I'm trying to do. It's a bit like method feeder fishing. You don't cast a method feeder fish uh, out. It's about, you don't move it away from that spot. You don't move it. What you do, it's all there in a, in a little ball. The fish come in and they feed it. And if you pull that method feeder away, you won't get a bite. And it's exactly the same with pole fishing. If you add that flow a foot away from the bait you'll put in, you won't get a bite. So always try to fish in, in your bait. And that's an easy way of putting your hook bait in the feed that you're putting in and hopefully the fish will come in and eat everything including your hook bait and you'll catch it. One of the biggest questions I get asked is the positioning of pole rollers. Where do they go? And believe it or not, it's one of the easiest to answer. So, where do I put them? Well, the first thing I do is the positioning on the angle of them. So if you're right-handed like me, all I want you to do is this. If you, if you look behind you, and imagine it's a clock phase, 12 at furthest away, six, nine, three. A right-handed person naturally strikes into his fish and ships back like that. So he lifts, strikes and ships back like that. And if you go back, that's 11 o'clock on a clock face. So that's the positioning of the rollers. If you're left-handed and you're the other way and you strike that way and come back, it'll be one o'clock. But I'm right-handed, so it's 11 o'clock. So that's positioning of it. It makes it easy. So you go like that and that's the natural. Because the thing is, most anglers put the rollers straight behind them at 12 o'clock. And the problem with that is, when you strike and go like that, you're not on the roller. So what you do, you move and you start looking where the roller is. And you're forgetting what's happening out there because it's not natural. So just move them from 12 o'clock to 1 o'clock and, and you'll just go like that. And that is a natural movement so that when you hook a fish, you're actually looking at the fish and you're floating your elastic and it'll naturally go onto the roller instead of looking where the roller is. So... The next thing is when you're fishing a long pole, you want two rollers really. If you've got two rollers, the positioning on them is really important because the biggest problem people make is that they have the back one too far near the end of the pole. And what happens is as you come back, it drops off the roller and the pole flicks up and course all the bait out, the pole pot goes all over the place and it makes a right mess and you finish up having to do it again. What you really want to do is this. You want it to get it in a position where you get your pole and when it, you put your sections together, you ship it out and you don't know that it's come off the rollers. There's no jerking or anything and it comes naturally into your hands. If it, you know it doesn't come off the roller, you know that the rollers in position are perfect. And it's so simple to get them in the right position is this. Between the net there and the end of the pole, let's for example say it's nine metres. Therefore, the two rollers want to be three metres and six metres. In other words, a third and two thirds up the pole. And that way, it'll just glide off nice and smooth and you won't get no jerk and it won't flip into the air and it won't spread bait all over the place. So all you've got to remember is clock face. If you're right-handed, it's 11 o'clock, a third way up the pole that's in the netting and two thirds and it'll run as smooth as clockwork. Now then, what if you've only got one roller? Well, if you've only got one ro roller, it's pretty simple. Just go up the pole, and if it's, say, nine, and nine metres, go to the halfway mark and just go a metre past. So it's roughly five and a half metres from there, so it's just past halfway, and that way it'll come off nice and smooth. Them's are two ways to do, whether you've got two roller or one roller. It's pretty simple, but if you, if you go with that, you won't get no jerking, you get no bait flicking up and down, and it just runs nice and smooth, and you'll have a perfect day. That's how you position your rollers. One of the questions I get asked is, what elastics do I use for which type of fishing? 
it don't bother me which style of fishing because it's about, to me, the hook size to the strength of the elastic. Because it's simply, what you don't want is a 16 elastic to a 20 hook because you'll just wear the hook out. And if you have a, like a 14 hook with 10 elastic, it won't set it. So it's a case of over the years, I've got the balance right and what I'm comfortable with. So I always have the size of the hook to the different thickness and, and strain of elastic that I'm going to be using. At the moment, I'm using the zip zip hybrid elastic so if i'm going to be using an eight a 20 hook or an 18 i use the white elastic which is a 10 to 12. if i'm going to be using an 18 hook it's usually the black elastic which is a 12 to 14. if i'm going to be using a 14 hook then i'm going to be using the 14 to 16 which is which is the green one and then if i'm using a bigger hook then i'm going to be using the blue so them's the right elastic for the size of the hook that I'm going to be using. And I keep it as simple as that. So when I'm going to a peg, if I'm, if I'm fishing with a 20 hook, it's quite simple. I just pick the white one out, an 18, the black, and so on. It's as simple as that. I keep it simple like that. What well, the most important thing is the length of elastic that's inside that top two, because you always want it to come back just. What most people do when they set elastic up, they have it too tight. So if you can imagine the outside of the pole and, this, and when they cut it down, it's about to there. What happens, it goes dung like that. And if it goes dung really hard and really tight, you're defeating the object of the elastic because you're tightening it up too much. If you're tightening it up too much, you might as well use the grade of elastic that's higher because it will just come dung. What you really want is it to come out and go back on its own nice and simple. The way to get that is this. You want it two inches less inside than it is on the outside. And, that's, and what will happen then is it will always go back on its own. Even though it's doing it right slow, look, it's going back. And that's what you want because then you're using the elasticity in the elastic to play the fish. Don't have it too tight. You don't want it going boom when it goes back in. If that happens, you need to use a grade of elastic that's higher because it will help you. So when you set it up, set it up, pre-stretch it at home, pull it so it's nice and tight and then cut it off so it's two inches smaller so it just goes back on its own like that and you can see that it's creeping in like that and you know that that's perfect setup and you know that when you're playing your fish you're playing the fish on the elasticity and my setups are as simple as that. I grade the hook to the elastic and it's two inches less inside and you won't go far wrong. What I always do when I'm playing a fish, look at the angle of the elastic. So you always play the fish with the pole a foot out of the water. And when the elastic's out, don't pull back, wait for it to come back under. And now it's coming under, as you can see, you can ship back. And one thing you mustn't do is rush. Just take your time and just nice and steady, foot off the water, use the rollers. When you get to the shipping point, undo it, put it in the net like that so it's nice and safe. And then all you do now is play the fish nice and simple. So when you come up, if it comes up and you're lucky and it's straight in front of you like that, you can get him. And that's all that you do. So when you're bringing it back nice and low, but you must always look at the angle of the elastic. If it's straight out, you don't pull against it, otherwise you'll lose the fish. There you go. Oh, that wanted that. Oh, well, it's all right, me old pal. There we go. Not a massive fish. The partridge mirror. Whoop! Hey up. <laughs> Here we go. Just got one in edge. A few fish feeding in edge now. One of the things when you're fishing in edge. Is this. Right, what we've got here? Oh, it's an F1. A nice F1. Come on, my little beauty. There you go. That's on a white fulker, that one. Look at that. There's nothing wrong with them at two and a half pounder pieces. Look at that. All right, pal, all right. Right, 
One of the things is about swim management and you've got to plan your match. And most people start inside. I've seen them do it and it's the worst place you can start when you're fishing. I always leave it for the last hour, last hour and a half if you're lucky. And the idea is to feed your swims up, swim management. So catch your fish out there and there, save the inside for last hour because that's when they're feeding the edge. So what I always do is halfway through the match I start feeding the edge like today. And the simple rules, when they're there you'll see them or you'll get indications. And all you do, it's the same procedure all the time, that little pot, fill it with bait. The fish have come in to feed now, so when you catch them inside the fish come in to feed. That's the idea. And all you do now, it's a little bit different because you're fishing in the edge. Now then, all I, uh, all I do, I ship out and the first thing you do is feed. Feed it same spot in the line that you want. So feed it, plop it straight in in the edge, there you go, as near to grass as you can. And then pick your rig up because it's out there and place it into that bait. So you can still go into your 10 second rule so you can hold it. So the rig comes under into the bait, let it go down. But what you do now, you put the pole to the bank. And there's two reasons why you have the pole along the bank. One, it shades. You're not, it's not over the fish. And the other thing is, when you hook a fish, it will swim straight out. What you've got to remember is that you've got all snags, all rubbish down this side. And if you have the pole that way, away over the bank, what happens is you hook the fish and it runs straight through all the rubbish and all the snags. So, have the bank, your pole down the bank, and it does two things. It covers your pole, there's no shadow over the fish, but most importantly, when you hook it, it will swim out and you hook your float or your hook bait is in the bait you put in and you're just impatient. When they come in, make sure you get a positive bite because it's shallow water, the fish come in and you don't want to foul hook them. End of day, the fish have come into that now to feed. If they've come in to feed, you want to be catching them. So you just sit there and be patient and when you get one, it'll swim out and you play the fish in the open water. One of the things when I go on a, any commercial fishery, the edge is a really important part of getting a big weight because if they come in to feed they're usually the bigger fish and you can catch them quite quickly but it's all about timing like I said you, uh, so what I always do is at start at match check the rules of the commercial fishery can you guard and can you cut the grass so what I try and do if, if you're allowed to is go and cut a little spot where you want to fish and if you cut a little trim the grass where you want to fish you can get in closer and the closer you get the more you'll catch what you don't want to be doing is away from the bank uh, a lot of time because you foul up the fish as the fish come in. So what you're trying to do is cut, cut it out, a little bit of garden, it tidy it up so you can get your float near the grass. But I see most people go too early down the side and they go too early, they catch a fish and then they can't catch. I, I like to leave it well, well an hour and a half, sometimes an hour, and uh, because that's when you're going to get most of the fish and, and most of your, mo your biggest weight. Oh, I've hooked the fish, it swam out, and now it's swimming out. Right. Nice and simple. So sh again, ship back, watch the elastic, the pole a foot off water. You can see that it's straight down, so it's swimming. So get, get your pole on the roller, bring it in close, lift it up, so it feel like another F1. It is, look, there you go, another F1. And that's the procedure. So, that one a white fulker again. Just keep catching them, put them in. Don't worry, you won't be catching them if you can't move in. So, so routine is this. I'm gonna put a white one again. Fill your pot up. Take your time. Never rush anything, just take your time. Put your pole together with your pot in upright position. And take your time, ship it out. When you get to the position, lay your rig out, out from the bank, like that. And then put your bait in, 
tip it straight in one swoop, lift your float up into that bait. 10 second rule, so it's in a straight line and, it, and your hook bait is going to be in that feed bait. And just put it down, pull down the bank and that keeps it perfect. So, as you, so that last fish, I hooked a fish and it just swam out because position of the pole. If you ever move the float, if it's ever you move it for some reason, I always go back to starting position. I always go back to the start where the position. So if you're not sure what float moves, go back to 10 second rule and you know that you're going to be in your bait. Now, now I've just put that bait in and already I've had an indication which tells me there's a fish come to bait. There you go, look. There you go. Perfect. Now this isn't an F1, trust me. This is a carp, this. And look, look how it's got where it is now because the pole were down that side and down that bank. And that's really important. And now I can play it. That's free now. The fish can come in and feed. It's all free now. I'm not disturbing the side. I'm not hooking anything. And all I'm doing is taking my time as I know this is a carp. Just take your time now. The elastic's come straight down now. So now it gives me license to ship back, put it on the rollers and break off into the netting position. And then you're playing the fish in front of you. All oh, that's nice and free where you're fishing. Oh, wow, it's a carp, all right. Whoa, it's trying to get right corner, this one. Whoa, 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 goodbye. Oh, no. Well, 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 no, this is definitely a good buy of this. <laughs> Talk about puller bungs. When do you use them? You use them when the fi not when the fish is going the other way, when it's coming towards you. And you can shape it like that and, and grip it. Never, ever pull it when it's going the other way. You only pull it when the fish is coming towards you so you can take a grip of the elastic and just shorten the elastic. And that's all that you do. I'm not a, a, I love using them, but I only use them when it's necessary. So like now, you can re-grip like that. And I've re-gripped my elastic. And if it wants to go, it can go. And if you have to let it go, you've got, you've got some security there. But use puller bungs only when you've got to. Look, it's all that fulcrum it's been eating this. Let's give it some energy. I think I'd better have some. There we go. Whoa, look at him. Oh, he's a, he's a Bobby Dazzler, him. Look at that one. Woohoo! White Fulker. <laughs> that's a beautiful common cat. That's £10 of anybody's money, but that's just a beautiful fish. Fully scaled common cat. Put it, put it low, it'll turn it. So, put it low that way, that way. That's it. See how it's coming? Ah, right, okay. Ah, I see. There you go. See, so I've turned it. So, I want to change direction. So yeah, you, you put it opposite way to fish. Oh, right. So, yeah, if it goes that, that way, you put like it low. Line fishing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, exactly the same. Yeah, okay. Like now, if you put it low, it'll, it, what will happen is it'll, it'll go top. down and it'll swim towards you. Put it right down. That's it. Watch it how it comes in there. Did you get that one and a yellow one? White one. All right. Because this yellow one, you've got the wrong name. Squash it. <laughs> Should be A up yellow. <laughs> I squashed it flat. Ah. It stuck in better, right. See how it's come in? There you go. Now if you ship back now and take that section off, keep it low all the time. That's it. Now put it low again. There you go. See how it comes see how fish automatically turns and wants to swim and come in and then it comes under the rod end. Right, where it is now now pick it up. There you go. And then you can net it now. You don't need to net it, you're going to do it yourself. Look, see. Oh. Why is he walking around the lake carrying a top kit? <laughs> this is Tommy's, Tommy yeah. Pickering's. And of course, I have completely messed. If you have a look at the float, I've broken his float. His favourite float he's had for over 10 years. And I've broken his line and I've tangled it. But I've had a really good time. You've had a great time? Yeah. Yeah. I'm now going to give it back to him and we're going to see what he uh, thinks of the fact that I've uh, messed everything up for him. Yeah. 
Hey, Tommy. Hey, Tommy. Do you, do you want your ball back now? What the? David, I've had that 20 years. <laughs> You've had it a day. <laughs> I've caught a load of fish though. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> oh, you made a right mess of that. It'll be favourite float, that. <laughs> it's my favourite as well. That cost me 10p, that, you know, off market. <laughs>